Hi, everybody. I'm really excited to bring you all the third episode of Common Ground. And our guest this time is Orson Scott Card. I'm sure the vast majority of you have heard of him because he's one of the most notable science fiction fantasy writers of our time. He's written books such as Ender's Game, the Alvin Maker series, as well as um, books like Speaker for the Dead. And we're going to talk here about the future science fiction and fantasy genres, and I think you're all going to really love this. Thanks as well to David Hamilton, who is my co-host, who, if you've been watching these videos, I'm sure you've seen a good amount of him talking as well, and their mutual friend, Joshua Carlson, who's also here to talk about all these different topics. And just to get started, Orson, what is what got you into writing as a fantasy or in science fiction writer? Well, it's going to sound very cynical, but I was a playwright and I recognized that I was never going to make a dime as a playwright. Uh, it takes too much of other people's money and too much of other people's creativity to bring off a play. So it would be very frustrating when I write a script and put on a play myself with friends uh, in a makeshift stage, then that's fine. But as soon as somebody has to make money, no. So I decided, well, I'll try fiction. And I looked at the genres of fiction and uh, literary fiction, if you weren't named John Updike, uh, you weren't going to make any money. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, there were very few paying markets for short fiction. And I had to start with short fiction. I mean, you don't want to try a novel first. And so uh, science fiction had a market for short fiction. Didn't You didn't get rich from it, but you got paid if it was accepted. And so that's where I started. And the first story that I sent out in a serious effort to... Uh, uh, to sell was called Ender's Game. Uh, it did not sell instantly, uh, but no one is really interested in the whole saga of how I finally got it accepted because it sounds like every other writer's saga of how they got a story accepted. Uh, but, you know, it, I, that, I, I keep repeating things that people pay me to do. And so uh, every now and then I'll write a novel that really doesn't fit the science fiction paradigm and then everybody is horrified when it doesn't meet the computer projections of sales in the bookstores. Uh, finally, finally, their computer projections began to recognize that there was going to be a difference between books by me that have the word ender or shadow in the title and books by me that don't. And uh, that it didn't mean that I had suddenly lost my audience. It just meant that it was a different audience. So there you go. But but uh, the shadow books were a different kind of thing. We, one thing we recognized was Ender's Game was followed by, read by, loved by an astonishing number of seven, eight, and nine-year-olds, which is not at all the demographic I expected. I made no youth concessions in the book. It's a book for adults. And the language is difficult. It's challenging. Yeah. But kids will read it if they care. They will find their way through the language if they care. And they did. Uh, I got so many letters from kids who are in gifted programs. That was no surprise, but also kids who were uh, in programs for um, remedial reading programs who loved Ender's Game because their teacher started reading it to them. And then after the first five chapters said, finish it yourself. And they did because they cared about the story. Now, to me, that is, you know, that's the toughest audience to please is, uh, young people who do not like to read. There's no harder audience, no more demanding audience. Uh, I would rather have them than English graduate students any day because English graduate students will uncritically accept whatever nonsense they're taught. But, uh, but kids, no, if they're not enjoying it, they're not enjoying it, you know, and they'll find something else to do. So, uh, that, that's the thing that really encouraged me was when, when a junior high librarian Ferrer Junior High in Provo, Utah said, you know, Ender's Game is our most lost book. And I thought, okay, it's the book kids can't stand to turn back. They want to, they want to keep it. That, that was my first standing ovation as an author. Yeah, that's, that's fantastic. Absolutely fascinating. And it brings you to a point I've been thinking about recently, that if you want to actually have a story that engages people and brings up philosophic questions and 
says something real, you're most likely going to do it in science fiction or fantasy today, where a hundred years ago you would have done it in classical literature or historic. And yeah, the thing with classical or normal literature is that it's kind of become, in my opinion, a masturbatory exercise where most of the books that, as you said, the literature grad students read, they're, they talk about the human condition, but their understanding of the human condition is entirely incorrect. Where <laughs> the human, my favorite book ever is Les Miserables because I think it shows what the human life is like. Is there's so much suffering and big questions and it's grand, but because I mean, I'm not going to go off too much of a tangent because this is what my show talks about. But because our era has shrunk its horizon so much, we can't talk about actual topics in our normal literature. It's mostly just people being depressed, in my opinion. But we have to do it in <sighs> fantasy realms. And I have to give your books credit for that, where both Ender's Game and Speaker for the Dead, I would consider them stories of mortality, where in I'm not going to spoil it, but for, but for both alien races, they have a different relation to mortality, and thus their entire philosophy of the world is different. So thus, that makes us question our own mortalities. Well, and and you know our our philosophy, our art, everything is built around death. Uh, when we yeah. structure our art, when we put a frame around a piece of uh, two dimensional visual art, uh, we have given it birth and death. There is an edge. There's an end. And because there's an end, we can say finite but final things about it. Exactly. And But if it's something that's open-ended, that is not ever closed, then how do we know how to review it? That's like Yelp reviews of restaurants. They're only reporting on what they, are, what they were fed today. And, of course, very few of them are actually honest anyway, so uh, pay no attention. But nevertheless, uh, I don't want to write a Yelp review of human life when I'm writing a, a novel. But I'm also, I, as soon as I catch myself being philosophical, I try to do what Shakespeare did in Hamlet, where he had this wonderful guide to behavior, a parent giving his son advice about how to lead his life, only he makes it very plain that the father is an idiot. And therefore, even though he says to thine own self be true, thou canst not that be false to any man, neither a borrower nor a lender be, uh, all excellent advice, but he's a clown. So we can't take that as being Shakespeare's advice. It's Polonius's advice. And my idea is that I need to follow that example. And if there's something that I realize, oh, this is what I believe, and it starts showing up in the story, I'll move it to a character who's an idiot. Who, or at least who's unreliable. That's and and so that so that uh, it gets said, and if somebody likes it, they'll like it. I mean, we still quote Polonius uh, freely, but uh, the idea is that if I ever write a passage that I'm especially proud of, where the language worked beautifully and, and people have admired that paragraph, it's gone, it's out of the book. Because what that does is it stops the reader from the ongoing experience. It would be like if I had, direct, had, had, had written a play and there was a wonderful line in the play that got a huge laugh. If I then, as they were laughing, as the laughter was dying down, I, I leapt on the stage and instead of yelling six emperor tyrannis, uh, I, I uh, yelled, hey, hey, did you like that line? I wrote that, that was me, I wrote that. And authors do that all the time, especially literary authors. You can see how proud they are of the way they're writing. And I don't want to be proud of the way I'm writing. I want to be clear about what I'm writing. I want the subject matter to be uh, the, the fair-haired child that I'm showing off and, and not me. I'm not the, if I'm the star of my own book, then I might as well be James Joyce and write for nobody. <laughs> well, well and also, I, if I could add, Roger, when you were talking about how a lot of literary – fiction produced now is very bland. I think a large reason for that is actually related to the specialization in our own education system, unfortunately. We specialize our authors so early. You go to school to be an author. Well, Douglas Wilson wrote a great book, by the way, I'd recommend it, Wordsmithy. And he talks about, among other things, he's like, don't just become an author. Go fish crab off Alaska. Go travel the United States. Go be a soldier for six years then you have something to write about because you have life experience. 
everything you know and everything you can write about wasn't taught to you in a classroom being refed to you like a bird refeeds its little uh, little baby birds. Um, you have to have something original to be able to present. Yeah. The problem is most I, of our authors don't. No, no. And I, in fact, so many of them sound like they're actually in class. Uh, you're still reading their essay. Uh, but uh, it, what I tell my writing students is uh, have a life, have a life. Even during the class, I make them get out of the classroom and talk to real people uh, because, you know, for one thing, writers get way better when they've had to support themselves from a real job. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go straight from your graduate creative writing program into being a professor of uh, creative writing yourself, you have had no life. Uh, you might as well be living in your mother's basement like uh, William Shatner's famous get a life speech to, to Star Trek uh, fans. Um, it's, it's those jobs that give you real people. It's what I loved about Richard Russo is that his early novels, he's, he's past that now, he's writing literary stuff, but his early novels did not feel like they had only literary people in them. In fact, what they had was only real people with real jobs, real concerns. And if you can't write that, you shouldn't be writing. If you can't write, you know, usually what they do is they write about their own family and how mad they are at their parents. And then they write about the, the uh, church group that they were in where nobody understood the weirdness of, of their life. Uh, whatever it is. They all, they all sound like angry children uh, ranting about how they were mistreated as a child, misunderstood. Because in a way, they're just writing about themselves. But I always also tell my writing students, if you catch yourself writing about a writer, stop and do something else. Because if you write about a writer, you're writing about yourself. And that kind of omphaloskeptic literature is useless to read because you have no life. What do you do? You sit in front of a screen and you type. How in the world do you have any experience to pass on to anybody? And, I think we'd uh, all agree, uh, Scott, that that applies to teachers as well. Well, sadly, yes. We've had a lot of teachers that had no life experience, and they're probably not the people we want teaching our children. Right. And it's, it's one of the things that uh, my, my mother was, for 20 years, I think, the head of the advisement center at the College of Business at BYU. Brigham Young has a college of business that has a good reputation. And they always place their graduates. Uh, but she had so many former students come back to her on a visit, not to her, but while I were on campus, they stopped in and said, yeah, I spent my first year unlearning everything I was taught in business college. Now, this is from a good school with a good reputation. But the real world of business had nothing to do with anything that they were taught. And that's what we find out, I think, from writers is that if they're taught to write well by the standards of a creative writing class, they're probably writing extremely badly. And then they wonder why they have no audience, why nobody cares when they publish a book, why they hold a signing and the only people who show up are people in the mall hoping that you can tell them where the bathroom is. Uh, because it's there's there's no following. What you want to do is write to real people. And if you write to real people, you have to be writing about the world that they know, then the philosophy takes care of itself. It's, you know, I would love to get credit for being uh, philosophically deep. I really do think about a lot of philosophical things. And when I really care about it, I write an essay. But when I'm writing my fiction, my characters care about the things they care about. And often they'll have thoughts that I've had, but not necessarily smart ones. I've had all the dumb thoughts too. And so they'll come up with a viewpoint that I once held or that I once wondered about. Uh, but my job is not to teach the true philosophy. Uh, my job is to tell the truthful story. And what I found is that when you're not paying any attention to themes, which is anathema in fiction, uh, to trying to write an essay in your fiction, if you're paying no attention to that, then you will do your best philosophical work because you have a philosophy an unquestioned philosophy, things that you believe without knowing you believe them, things you don't know you believe because it can't, doesn't occur to you that anybody could not believe them. We all have those, the deepest things. And you know how you find out what somebody's deepest beliefs are. You question it until you make them mad. I found that out in grad school at uh, Notre Dame when uh, I was taking the aesthetics class and I started mocking Platonic philosophy. And 
everybody was furious around the table. And then I realized, gee, I'm the only uh, non-Catholic here. And uh, that Western Christian viewpoint was thrown out by the Mormon church a long time ago. We don't see the universe through Neoplatonic eyes. And therefore, uh, I had forgotten that the foundational document of uh, Western Christianity was more likely to be uh, uh, the symposium by Plato than anything in the New Testament. And so uh, I had offended their deep religion that they didn't know was their religion. Uh, I, I found the place where they didn't know they believed it because they had never met anybody till me who didn't believe it. And actually, I think if I could if I could dovetail off of that with Scott, I think that's another if we're if we're pointing to the fiction and why a lot of it is very shallow. It's that it's entirely possible for students to go through university and never encounter an idea that is triggering because it's being systematically expunged. And that gives you a very one-sided, very flat view of the world, and it divides the world into caricatures. Either it's the people that believe the awesome, amazing things that everyone clearly would have to believe if they were to be normal and reasonable, or you're some caricature, you know, twirling the mustache that I don't have, that, you know, is somehow evil and trying to destroy everything that is good. There, there's nothing in between. That's right. And That's right. It, it doesn't make sense. Joshua, if I might, Joshua, if just what we might have you do is share a little bit about your background. I'm not sure the audience knows enough about you. And uh, my, you had given the fact that you work in the space industry. Uh, it might be interesting for you to maybe posit a few questions, et cetera, and have a and sort of have a conversation with uh, Scott about that and have um, and have Rudyard chime in. Yeah, the, the problem here is that whatever questions Josh raises, he knows the answer to, and I have no clue. I uh, do. I am not a scientist. I only uh, feed off of the. Uh, publications of science fiction writers and a few scientists. Well, I, I'll try to posit a few questions. So very quick background about me, obviously. I'm, I'm sure you've probably picked up on some of it. My background is English. I got uh, a master's in English, and so I can I can point and throw stones at myself for a lot of the same things I've been pointing <laughs> out. Um, talking about students on question, I remember, I remember there was one time in class that this whole student said, wait, but if postmodernism is true, then there is no truth. So even the truth thing, even stating it is true is not true. And the, stu the professor was like, yeah, but we're just going to assume that's true and move on. So <laughs> <laughs> no, I missed the point because the answer to the post-truth idea is, well, do you want to come to the dinner with the rest of us tonight? If I give you directions to that dinner, do you want them to be my truth or actual directions? And yeah. that's where you start going, oh, yeah, I do believe that there is such a thing as truth. So didn't Plato prove that the chair was there, the chair wasn't there? No, Plato would never, question. yeah, but, well, that, well, that's, that's what so, students of Neoplatonism would worry about. Okay, so, 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 so I remember right, reading something uh, one time where it was proven that the chair was there, then they turned around and argued and proved that the chair wasn't there. Now, if you pick the chair up and hit him with it, They'll probably yeah, it's just, it's just, that that uh, ends the discussion pretty effectively. Yeah, it's like your directions, absolutely. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I forgot. I, I want to say it was C.S. Lewis said that there's all sorts of modernists who will claim they don't know what's true and that he doesn't know if he exists until you strike him, and suddenly he's very convinced of that fact. I mean, um, the points you bring up add a couple of things together. Where, first of all, their concept of truth is not actually a real position; it's a form of shaming. So that they can weaken their opponents, and the second they get power, they shove propaganda down. And the conversation we've been having so far, it speaks to me in a couple of different ways. The first is almost – I can't stand to watch new movies or TV shows because the writing is propagandistic. And you can tell if something is propaganda, as Peterson says, based off does the author know what they're saying before they finish it? And although I'm not a fiction writer, when – the biggest thing I talk about in my show is the life cycles of civilizations. And when I try to write about a civilization, I'll try to think, how does the Indian mind work? What are the influences that resulted in that? And what is their perspective on what they're doing? Because only through getting that can you actually comprehend why they made their decisions. And there's not that, an example of that not happening is the Velma is the Velma TV show or Josh said that writing today is, or I think Orson actually said that writing today is built around trying to get an audience to love you. And if you listen to a lot of the writing styles that are going on today, it's 
trying to, it's so self-aware and tries to break the fourth wall because it lacks the confidence to actually make a statement unironically. And Orson's point of also trying to be a real person and get feedback from the actual world when you write, I think it's very true. And it's one of the things I love about YouTube where I'm 21 now, I've been doing my show for approaching nine years now. And one of the things I love about YouTube is that your audience will just tell you what they hate in the most brutal language. And so it creates a sort of honesty with improving yourself that's not there in any other aspect of life. Yeah, the trouble is that idiots can be honest and still say something, nothing useful to you. Yes. So you still have to weed out uh, all of that honesty. I I find that it doesn't excuse anything when somebody says, well, I just, I just have to be honest. And I, no, you don't have to be honest because you don't know what truth is. You don't know the truth. So how can you tell me the truth? All you can tell me is, yeah, that's right. All you can tell me is what you think the truth might be. And you should be a little more humble about it because you're probably wrong the way that I'm usually wrong. Uh, whenever I think I've got something nailed down, I know exactly what it is. Then I'll find out that about 90% of what I thought at the edges is going to be wrong. And I'm going to have to keep revising my view, which is how science works. That's what science is all about, is questioning everything. Uh, you know, as soon as you say, if you talk about the earth circling the sun, it's heresy, you need to be burned. Uh, or when you say, uh, if you question the idea that that human activity is a significant source of global warming and that global warming is going to be disastrous. And then you don't allow anyone to question either of those premises. Uh, you have said, oh, we're not going to do science now. This is religion. And we're going to have people take it on faith and obey us and do lots of useless things uh, that are in service, you know, sacrifices that mean nothing bringing all of your chickens to be sacrificed on the altar and uh, saving none of them for your own dinner. Well, and as we were so talking about, we can sacrifice the cows because at least you'll, you know, reduce the flatulence. So you'll have. Yeah. <laughs> yes, that's, that helps global warming. So this side, guys, this issue, this way of being, it, it colors every aspect of our lives, right? We can't have a honest conversation. We can't have a nuanced conversation and we can't disagree with anybody, even in the slightest. Otherwise we will be canceled. We will be beaten up, um, uh, excommunicated, et cetera, because most of what we're talking about here has become a religion and it is separated from reality because most of the people that we talked about earlier, haven't real lived real lives, had real jobs, made a payroll, um, started a business, et cetera, right? I yeah. went back to B-School, and I knew when I went back to B-School, I didn't care what I learned. I just wanted the paper. I said that up front. I, that's going to give me another chance to interview with some consulting firms. And if I learned anything, that would be great. I didn't count on it. So many people thought they were getting out of B-School to be brilliant. I go, no, this is a ticket to learn, right? You, 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 you now got a ticket to get on the train, and uh, but, Nate, but now you got to put coal in the, in, in the train to, to get there. So this happens throughout our lives. It's affected literature. It's affected entertainment. It's affected politics, et cetera. The reason we're called Common Ground is we're trying to find a way for everybody to have a nuanced conversation, an open and honest conversation, to not cancel people and tell people who question anything that they're not scientific, which gets back to a lot of the things that Rudyard talks about, which is shaming people, et cetera, as a way of sort of what I call verbal karate. It's a, it, it's a way of winning, right? Um, I spent over almost 30 years in the civil rights movement. I consider myself a classic liberal, but I don't know what that is anymore. In no. today's world, I don't think I changed any of my positions from where when I was a young man. I think I believe the same things, but my world has changed so much that I think a lot of people, especially the hyper uh, hyper woke, as I like to call them, um, would call me a conservative or a moderate or something like that. And I go. I don't know where I am. So let's not call ourselves those names. It would be really nice if we could stick to a few policies and come up to some solutions. Yeah. But instead we label and back to your first point, Scott, it's all about being tribal. Yes. Yes. It's, uh, we, we belong to a tribe, whether we like it or not, we grew up in a tribe, uh, whatever our parents believed or the people around us believed. But when you go to university, you change tribes, you become of the, the tribe of the university people. And sadly, and not your the mama. people. Not your right. Well, I remember uh, at a conference of uh, interdisciplinary studies programs uh, held at Watauga College at, at Appalachian State University, 
uh, I was there as a guest speaker uh, because I had been teaching with that program. But one of the pro one of the uh, items on the program was a panel discussion on how to get your students to stop believing the myths of their parents' religion. And I thought, wow, most of you guys are representing tax supported universities and you think your job is to teach the children not to not to believe what their parents believed even though it's perfectly possible to pursue a very good career in any field uh, while still believing in the faith of your fathers and uh, and so that I uh, in my keynote speech at the end of the program I I tore them one over that mm -hmm. I said you know how dare you take tax money from citizens in order to destroy their culture. Uh, that's so, not what you're here for. So, so I don't consider myself a deeply religious person. I'm just no, not. And, no. and, and, and I share that up front. But it doesn't threaten me if someone talks to their invisible friend, God. It really doesn't bug me. I don't give a damn what, to, you know, what, what church they go to. I don't care what their practices are, et cetera. Um, but it seems to deeply disturb some people if you believe in something, you carry something around in your head that they don't carry around in theirs. So why that matters to them, I can't get. So I've, I think I've got the answer for that. And I'm sure, Roger, I, I've heard you talk about this. I'm, you know where I'm going. So I would actually equate this all back to communism. I would equate this all back to a form of authoritarianism. And we were talking about religion and the fact that the modern religion is one of atheism. But it has and it has its own orthodoxy. It has its own priests, which are the people that get up on television and say, you need to believe science, which I don't know what that means, because if you were living 1500 years ago, science would have been that the sun goes around the earth and you need leeches to keep you healthy. So I don't know what it means to believe in science or trust the science. Science changes all the time. Now, I can trust the current findings as the best we have, perhaps. But when you start browbeating me and telling me that I shouldn't even question what's going on, that, as we said, that, that's gone into religion. And I, I would also point out that in communism, religion, the family, the community, these are things that have to be atomized. Because without, if you're going to make a new culture that is, it, it is only under the government, the government has become God in communism. You must destroy all the other things that can possibly get in the way of staving off this totalitarianism when it comes and religion is the number one thing because ultimately communism is at its basis atheistic it must not have god otherwise it cannot stand because if you have a duty to your fellow people a religious duty that is beyond life and death then communists cannot threaten you with death and hope to change everything i i would really change beyond that I would only change the word communist to, to, to totalitarian no, 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 because, yes, because I'm afraid that, that philosophically I actually am a communist with a small C. And uh, the government in the Soviet Union and in China was never for one second communist. Uh, they, they had a communist party, but they never even seriously attempted to enact communism. It's a bastardization of the term and the concept. Yeah, it's not, yeah. yeah. yeah it's a to misuse clear, of the term and the concept. Yes, to be clear, there's totalitarian big C. Like yeah. They, yes. They meet in the middle or at the ends. Um, so I'm okay with people saying that they want to tear down the system, the current system, if it's conditional. You give me a better option. Yeah. And the, the the vast majority of people I knew growing up in the civil rights movement. I mean, I was friends with Percy Sutton, who was Malcolm X's attorney and mentor. I mean, I was a follower of Alinsky. I drank the freaking Kool Aid. Right. I was okay with all of that until I never heard an answer to. So what are we going to do? How are we going to make it better? What policy? What approach? You don't like education? Okay. Are you willing to give choice? Vouchers? Are you willing to close the top, the bottom 10% where kids are in danger and drugs are rampant, et cetera? Are you willing to do anything? No, I just have to tear it down, and I am not going to worry about a better option, all right? And every single policy issue that we deal with, et cetera, for example, taxation, how about this? If you don't think the rich are paying enough tax, let's go to a consumption tax. Yeah. But, and then everybody pays on what they buy or whatever. And then, by the way, the IRS doesn't have as much power and they can't come after you and all that kind of good stuff, right? So I'd like it's, to neuter them. But that's a solution that may not be right, but it's a recommendation. It's a prescription. It's a policy option that I never hear from the people who say, I have to tear down the system. 
and so jumping into Richard's, so Richard's great video recently, I'm, I'm going to pat you on the back. That was a great video. The one Thank talking you. about the right, the coming right, far right backlash. Um, I think that there is a, there is a lot of truth in that video in particular talking about the modern left is essentially chaos. And a lot of the left has embraced postmodernism, which posits that there is no truth. And you could take this also back to post-structuralism, which is Derrida and talking about that the world exists in binaries. You have to flip the binary, destroy the binary, you create something new. That's the, the concept of this new thing you're going to make. So bringing it back to science fiction, fascinating science fiction article I read talking about postmodernism in this particular story and how you would just, you would like reform yourself. And it gets to the very end of it. And he goes, you know what? We we come into a problem though, because every time we destroy a binary, we create a new one. We just reinscribe it. So and that but and he recognized that as the conclusion. He says, so what do we do about it? Well, let's just destroy the binary and recreate it as fast as possible. Scribbling like essentially scribbling like a madman, trying to make Shakespeare. Because if we recreate fast enough, maybe we will get something. You'll stumble on it. It's that's an incredibly that's an incredibly damaging and well, ruthless. We philosophy. perform we perform ridiculous experiments on ourselves with no idea of what it will do to society and no ability to criticize what it's done. There are things that that have been accomplished that we know uh, needed to be done, but the, they also had unintended consequences which people are paying for terribly, awfully. I mean, you speak, David, of the uh, uh, civil rights movement. Now, the civil rights movement needed to be done. It was desperately overdue. Mm -hmm. And yet it led us to things that have in some ways become counterproductive. Uh, I have swung I, way yeah. too many ways. Yes, absolutely. I have black friends who don't want to go to a black doctor because they know that they got their medical education through affirmative action. Now, that's not fair. There are wonderful black doctors, and I have had some myself, but but uh, you still have to realize that, that if you make it so that an entire race believes that their own credentials are suspect, then is affirmative action doing any good? Uh, maybe, maybe it needs to be uh, rolled back, especially because it only happens at the expense of perception of yeah. capability, right? Now, plus, plus was, it, it, it also, it only, it's done at the expense of the weakest members mm -hmm. of the major society. So if I was in, wearing my old Alinsky hat, I would take that snippet that you said, I would cut it out out of context, and I would bury you with it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Right. Because and I, I would expect to be buried because I believe. You didn't say what you believe. You stated what th th this has made them believe. But yes. If we're in war, if we're battling, everything is fair, right? And I can right. do whatever. And this is what we see over and over again because I'm tribal, because it's me versus you, is me trying to. You, you, we can't have a nuanced conversation. What you said just now took too long for anybody to oh, think about. Well, it, it, it's it, not it, a soundbite. You're absolutely it's right. It's not a soundbite, right? But I can take a soundbite and I can crush you with it, right? Because yeah. Orson Scott Sackar says that black doctors are less um, <laughs> capable. That, that's uh, I, hope, I hope that uh, that's the statement that I that I dread. But yeah. Yeah, no, but that—that's what is normally done during a nuanced conversation where people are trying to have. If you talk about some from the perspective of another person, see, you're very good about putting yourself in the shoes of someone else. That you're empathetic. That's why you're able to write stories from their perspective and tell their story. Okay, most people can't do that. They hit. I heard this one little thing. OK, and I like to think that other people are evil anyway, so I'm just going to believe that, right? I'm going to believe what I want to believe. Um, the, part of the reason we're talking about all of this is, and you know, we're, we are going to talk about space a little bit, but the issues that I have, the concerns are we, we're going to talk about space, but that's just another frontier to repeat the same crap one more time in a different realm with maybe harder technological uh, issues to deal with, right? Getting there is hard. Everything's expensive. Weight's a problem. You can die. There's no air. No one, can hear you, yeah. no one can hear you scream. All, yeah. all that good stuff, right? <laughs> Great movie. If they could hear me scream, they would say, oh, we just supplanted humanity out here. We moved humanity out, out outside of our, and we're going to destroy ourselves out here too. Because we are doing the work of our enemies, and especially in the United States. We'd all agree on that, right? We're, we're, we are, the thing, the, the existential threat we have is ourselves. We, we don't have any other existential threats. We only seem to have the one that is us tearing ourselves apart. And I thought I'd let you, Josh, and, and, and uh, Scott, and uh, Rudyard uh, riff on that. I mean, the way I see these things is 
it's effectively pushing class interests, where if you look at the history of civilizations, in each civilization, a certain social class will seize control of the society, and then it will turn that entire society to benefit their social class. And that stalls progress, because you fundamentally need to have checks and balances in order to have a society continue to work. And in India, that was the priests. In China, it was the bureaucracy. In Rome, it was the slave owners. And for us, it's the managerial class. It's people who have college degrees, working in large corporations, working in the government. And all of the policies being proposed by the left exist to give people of college degrees more power and influence. And this is something that, I mean, I have a whole video about this, so I can't kind of go into too much detail here. But one of the things I've seen is that I've done a good amount of networking among young, successful people in my age group. And this is weird to say, I often forget people do go to college because of all the successful young men I know, none of them are college graduates. I went to college for a semester and you're establishing this new leadership class that has absolutely, that just does not like college and has no experience with college. And, and it may be a healthy thing. It, it is. It's a really healthy thing because once again, uh, when people come to me uh, when I'm doing a public appearance and they say, well, I want to, you know, a 16 year old says, I want to be a writer. What should I major in? And I say, why are you going to college? Why aren't you writing? Why aren't you writing right now? Because you don't have to have a degree to write. You don't have to have any training. Nobody else has any training. And the training you could get will be useless. Say, okay, so you are going to college anyway because you want to have a meal ticket. So don't major in English. Steal the graduate reading list from the English department and read everything on it. And form your own mm -hmm. opinions of those writers because you are their peer you are giving them peer review and whoever you detest is bad and whoever you really enjoy is good because you are the only standard of judgment that you can accept there. And so you, you, the college is not needed. I, I beg people not to go to college and none of them obey me because they know that they have to have that credential in order to get a decent job, except you, you have to sell your soul to get, that credential, if you are going to go into journalism, you have to accept the absolutely rigid belief system of the entire journalism department. The entire faculty was given tenure on the basis of compliance with the doctrine. And so you will only hear the doctrine. And if you try to write something that is out of line, you will be punished. And we've seen it in among professionals uh, that, that you lose your standing if you try to tell the truth about something, if your truth doesn't fit. So we've got these tribes mm -hmm. and the tribes insist that if you are not absolutely conformist with the belief of the tribe, then you must be a complete conformist with the belief of the enemy tribe. Mm. So somebody who... Like, you know, me, I, I, I've had people come to me because of some things I've written and say, well, why aren't you a Republican? Why are you still a Democrat? And I said, well, I don't know why I'm still a Democrat, but I know why I'm not a Republican, because it would take 10 minutes for Sean Hannity to find out what I believe and call me a rhino, a Republican in name only, because mm -hmm. I don't fit their paradigms either. You know, how can I be uh, for the death penalty? How can I? We're, we're too fallible. Too many people have been found to be falsely convicted who were on death row and would have been killed without DNA evidence. And what other evidence are we lacking? What other people have been railroaded? We are too fallible to have the death penalty. Well, that means that I'll never be a member of that tribe because they that's one of your uh, shibboleths. You have to believe that in order to be a member of the group. And so you question anything and you're a complete hater on the other side. You question any dogma of feminism and you're a misogynist. Well, well so, and I would I would say if you don't even conform to um, J.K. Rowling, ninety eight percent feminist, I would say, and she on one one issue of dogma, she missed a she missed a comma there, and well, she's she, she didn't even she, miss. She's, she's, she's actually a better feminist than the people who ex expelled her. They're not yeah. feminists at all anymore. Their religion has moved way past anything like feminism. They're not but, loyal to women. 
one of your biggest points is that because she did, did, did um, defers in, uh, in one tiny thing, right? Then therefore she's a complete apostate. It's yep. all or nothing, right? Anything. So every revolution sort of cannibalizes itself, right? Yeah. You think of the French Revolution, et cetera. All of the zealots said, well, you're not zealot enough towards the end. And they ran out of rich people to chop their heads off. And I like to say that the guillotine is always thirsty, right? Yeah. I have to, I have to get the, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to eat this guillotine sitting here. I'm going to use it for something. And if yeah. you, if, just like a witch trial or whatever, if you're not zealous enough and I out virtue signaling, cause this is an arms race and virtue signaling, signaling, right? I, I, the only way I win this game is to beat you and be more virtuous than you. And by your standards of virtue. Yeah. By our, by our dogma, by our doctrine. Right. And if, and if you don't, then yeah, I can, I can, I can, I can even counsel you th that I agree with 99% of the time. Yes. This well, is, and the, the thing is that this isn't. Hey, I'm sorry, Richard. This isn't a. This isn't a tribe. This is a cult. Is what we are describing. Yeah, and there, I'm getting a little uncomfortable because I, you know, like like Scott, I consider myself a, a, a classic liberal or whatever that is. I was a Democrat all my life, right? But I have to say, I know what I'm also not. There are a handful of basic principles, and this gets back to the first thing you said, which is our basic truths. Okay. Can we agree on basic truths? You're entitled to your own opinion, but not your own facts, right? If America is a nation, nations have borders, and to some degree or another, you control those, right? There are a small number of people, and they're not Democrats, they're not whatever. They're zealots on a, um, on a far end of the continuum who say, no, I believe in complete open borders. Any man, woman, or child who can crawl here, fly here, get here because of my narco money, it doesn't matter, I, I, I get to come in. I can't have an argument with that person. If they're that extreme, right, if you want to say that you're pro-immigration, I'm very happy to have that conversation because there's a lot of great things about immigration, right? Okay, uh, And everyone knows, oh, yes, this country was built on immigration. Thank you. Lecture me some more. You know, don't you know, pat me on the head and patronize me. Yeah, we got that. But if you say that there's anything negative at all about um, my immigration, you are a xenophobe. You are a racist, et cetera. Yep. Yep. So I don't know what to do, but it seems to be that that tiny 1% of the pack is running everything, right? They're controlling what we call the Democrat Party, the far, far right. I don't know. I, you know, the far, far right, I think pretty much everybody hates them. I think Including pretty much themselves. They're embarrassed. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, we, we've gone after Nazis really hard, right? We use RICO laws to go after the Aryan nation types, et cetera, right? You know, and to I go think, after people who oppose abortion. And, and, and now we're going after people yeah. who oppose that or, or, you know, going after you for being a Catholic or whatever, right? Yep. So um, this is the future that we – I worry about for our children. Uh, I have two boys, a 19 or 24-year-olds. I worry about for Rudyard, who's 21. I, I worry about for Josh because he's under 60, you know. Come on, you know. Um, still a lad. He's got a, yeah. still, still got a lot of living to do, right? And while I don't think America is ever going to be what it was 30, 40 years ago, okay, um, it still needs to be a great place to live where you have great opportunity and you don't feel like a complete schmuck because you're an American and you don't feel like you're a complete schmuck because you happen to be a born a white male and you yeah. don't need to. I mean, so, uh, one, of the yeah, things, one of the things I've seen that this reminds me of is that when I talk to boomers, they basically say, kid, you're a centrist because I'm – pro-choice, I'm pro-immigration under most circumstances, I'd be fine with a government-run healthcare system, but when I talk to people my age, I'm automatically put on the right, because when, in my age group, woke, woke people basically controlled every institution of society, so we grew up with them controlling the media, the education system, um, basically universities, every output of human thought. And this has created a kind of bizarre coalition of you got Andrew Tate, who's like a, an, an agro pimp. You have Christian fundamentalists. You have libertarians. You have Petersonians. You have people that by all accounts are left wingers, like the Russell Brands of the world. And they're all under the same broad tent coalition. Can I talk real quick? I had two points real quick on college and then we can maybe move to space because this is a fascinating sure. conversation. We're going to run out of time. And we'll edit this. And by the way, you're both invited to come back again at length, right? I, I would love to. I'm sure. So go ahead. Go ahead, we're, sir. We're, we're barely yeah. scratching the surface here. But um, so two things about college. So the first one is going to college. 
because of government loans, the cost of college has gone up so much that ultimately going to college essentially traps you in debt as you are starting your career. Most people go to come out of college with a significant debt, and that's that's a horrible weight to have to bear as you're trying to start. It, it's it it is an extreme it is an extreme statement, but I would even argue it's a form of indentured servitude. You are starting out in the negative at the at the time when you are earning the least first, and that's one big thing I have with college I do not like. Second, is that um, college, especially as we were just saying, it, it presents so many thoughts, and it's it, it attempts it it presents a framework with which to see the world. What is so dangerous about that, as is we were already talking about, it's been taken over by the extremists, mostly the woke. By the way, I, I think it's funny they call themselves woke. You know what happens when you stay woke too long? You go insane because you yes. have to sleep occasionally. <laughs> the same. But you have, you have a, a framework being presented that frames everything else. What really is dangerous about that is it, it, it plays into confirmation bias. Once you believe something and you think you see something, your brain will naturally find things that concur with that and strengthen that presupposition. And that's incredibly dangerous when you only have one side presented because you, you create a huge confirmation bias on one side. And at that point, you not only have to get back to zero, then you have to present evidence to attempt to break that. And you've got already, we, we specified, the institutions that are controlled, the media, entertainment, all of these things are just presenting all the things that are supposed to correspond with what you are already supposed to believe as the orthodoxy, the confirmation bias that's already so, been uh, Josh, is, in education. Uh, Joshua, can we set the ideology uh, discussion aside for just a second? I think we're all in agreement that 99% of all professors you know, consider themselves uh, left of center, leftist, or liberal, et cetera. at least will not admit to being anything other than that. Well, when polled, they say they are. 90% of all school, high school teachers consider themselves to be liberal. I mean, they're, if they're honest, they'll tell you that's their view. Got all that. Okay. Here's what's interesting. The way people assess problems and analyze things drives me insane. When people look at why college costs so much, they don't get the fact that because it's so sub heavily sub subsidized, which was Josh's point, there's so much money thrown at it with only X number of slots that the price goes up, Econ 101, plus every man, woman, and child who's brilliant that comes from India or China wants to come here. So we got all that supply driving it up. But the answer to this, the solution to these people is to say, we need more college educated people. No, you don't. You need more jobs for the people with the college educations that they have. They need to have more real life skills, which is sort of the things that you were talking about earlier, Orson, et cetera. Um, and, um, what we don't need is to continue to prime that, et cetera. Then the other nuancing that comes in, and now because you made the decision to buy this thing and it didn't work out for you, you want me to cover that cost for you and you want the government to cover that because you made that bad decision, even though a forklift driver is not getting reimbursed for the class they took to become a forklift driver or a whatever. So there's about five or six different elements to that discussion. If you just take the college education discussion, what the problem is people diverge and you get two different kinds of views of it. And they come up with different bizarre solutions like we need more college education and we need to make it free or whatever. No, you stop taking left handed basket weaving, get a real degree, something that will actually get you a job. Um, and maybe we need to stop subsidizing it. Maybe we stop subsidizing jobs that don't, I mean, careers, I'm, I'm sorry, edu uh, degrees that don't get jobs. It's In economics, certain things drive behavior. Insurance is an evil thing. Insurance drives bad behavior. There would be no houses in flood zones or hurricane zones if there wasn't insurance to cover for that. People wouldn't be stupid enough to put their house in a flood zone Right. It's only the fact and a, and a lender won't give you the money to do it if you're in a 10 year flood zone or a, even 100. Right. So because we subsidize things, et cetera, we end up with these bizarre results, these unintended consequences. It bothers me that people don't think this way. And their answer then is, oh, let's get more college educated people. It's, really? Uh, so we can indoctrinate you, by the way. My friend Kurt Doolittle has a wonderful term about this, and it's called magical thinking. And he said one of the big problems of the modern world is because science provides the veneer of objectivity because you can get wonderful results with electric lights or have grain harvests go up by four times over in a 30-year period, 
that people think magically where I want to believe in something and thus I will start with the assumption I would like to believe. And then if you say that's not actually the correct assumption, they'll shame you. Where, for example, in every single thing, we start with the assumption of equality and capability, but that's clearly not true. Some people are born smarter. Some people are born more hardworking. Men and women clearly have neurological differences. But the thing is, if you question that assumption, which it comes out of a position of magical thinking, you'll be shamed. Well said. And I was a product of that. I grew up in the 70s mostly, where I was told, I am woman, hear me roar. I marched for the ERA. I led marches, et cetera, right? And I was told, and I believe solemnly, that there was no difference between a man and a woman at all. So we're essentially the same. That if you give them the same opportunity, to yeah, really? Get in the ring with me. If you're a buck 50 woman and I'm a buck 90 male, this is what we see in the trans uh, sports issue, right? And there are differences. I didn't want to believe that, but there are differences. And there are benefits to, to both sides uh, of, of, of the abilities, et cetera, right? And, exa and as a matter of fact, in today's world, a lot of the skill sets and capabilities that women have innately uh, advantage them in a, uh, in a business setting, in their ability to communicate, empathy, these sorts of things, et cetera, right? Um, that you know, being bigger, stronger, faster, and aggressive doesn't necessarily help you, right? Well, we, we were talking about truth. I think you hit on it, David, and this is, this is something I wanted to emphasize in that even though, David, you're, uh, you said you're, you're a, a classical liberal, Roger, you're kind of a, a centrist, um, I would consider myself more on the religious right. But I would also consider myself that the, the mantra that I've always had, and I, I say it in my book as well, is that uh, it must be truth before all. And the, the, the beginning of truth is ultimately, among other things, humility and the fact that you have to understand that you are not necessarily – actually, I would argue almost certainly not right about everything you believe simply because – you believe it does not make it true. Neither does it guarantee that there is anything approaching objectivity in that. It's simply your decision. Now, if someone presents evidence to you, that's fine. And you have to evaluate the source of that evidence and all sorts of stuff there. But shaming you for it, that this is a, well, I think, I think you said it, but you're actually in your video. I hate to keep going back to your videos, but it was quite nice when I listened to it. Thank I'd recommend you. it to everyone. But the fact that the, that, um, it's, it's easy to argue in a more feminine sense of shaming is one of the big things. Not arguing about facts and the reality of it. It's simply that me and my friends believe this. You and your friends don't. Therefore, we're right. And you must be wrong because clearly we're the right ones. And, 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 and when you say that, it makes me feel bad. And if mm -hmm. it makes me feel bad, it must be wrong. Um, and you're a bad person for doing it. Yeah. yeah. And so – Sorry, I was I was just going to add one quick thing is I, I forgot. I think it was David. You said um, that the United States will never be where it was in the 1990s um, again or something like that in our lifetimes. Um, I actually would phrase it a little bit different. and I want to draw in a little truth from 1984 as well. What actually happened in the 1990s is that the world will never never be that way again. And the United States just happened to be blessed, incredibly lucky, however you look at that. But we went from a. a a polar world with two poles, the USSR and the USA, USSR and the whole Warsaw Pact and all of them, the second world in that world system collapsed entirely. There was no one to oppose the United States for about 15 years, I would argue, until about 2005 when China had rose and risen to the point where they began to assert themselves. And I think that they are, are absolutely <clears throat> we are in a new great power competition with them. But in 1984, it talks about the fact that once a nation is able to surpass conflict and it does not have to concern itself with objective reality in the truest sense, it is able to stray into whatever narrative that it wants because it doesn't pay the, the, the piper, so to speak, for believing false things because it doesn't matter. It is sufficiently powerful enough to simply overwhelm anyone who would attempt to uh, counter it. And the problem is that's not the truth anymore for the United States. The United States is on the cusp of great world, is, is in great power competition, and we cannot afford to simply have our own magical thinking. And we're in, we're, in steep, we're in steep decline. 
uh, as well, because we no longer have belief in our own culture. The culture that brought us here is not the culture we have. And uh, it's like the Roman Empire. Uh, people talk about the Roman Empire lasting for a thousand years. No, the Roman Republic had one culture. The, uh, the first emperors had another culture. There was yet another culture. And what, what lasted was some kind of monetary system. And that's, that's about it. I remember though, uh, talking about what tribes believe. Um, I grew up in a fairly, uh, not really fundamentalist. Uh, we Mormons don't fit into anybody's niche, but, but, uh, you know, there, I, I grew up with the ideas of creationism, uh, floating around at church. Uh, but I checked out a book from the, uh, middle school library or the elementary school library that was about primitive human beings, the cavemen. Neanderthal, etc. And my dad saw that I was reading that. And I was unaware that there was any idea that that would be contradictory to any scripture. I had no idea. Why would I? And so I was reading that and my dad came, stood in the door of the room that I was in and he said, okay, son, if you ever come into a place where religion and science are in conflict, remember that one or the other or both of them are wrong. And that was startling to hear that from my very orthodox Mormon father. But he said, we believe that we don't have all the answers yet. And anybody who starts saying that we do doesn't understand what answers we do have. Yes. Because what we know is we have so much left to learn. And That's I, the humility that, thing that Josh brought up earlier. That, that yeah. coincides with that nicely. And, and by the way, I want people to understand that um, the the past version of America was not perfect. You know, I grew up very, very poor. We were homeless briefly. Um, you know, worked li worked all over the South. You know, literally picked cotton the whole nine yards. Right. So uh, it was pretty crappy. And I got fist fights with my football buddies because they like to beat up gay guys for being gay. And I was called queer lover in high school. So it wasn't Pollyanna. You know, um, sound of music. You know, back then. But this culture that you talked about, about feeling like we are a country, that America has a culture, that we have certain ethos, we have a, a social mobility, uh, uh, the American dream, um, this lack of being divided that we, we felt largely as, as Americans. You know, Now, if you were a ethnic minority, if you were black in the South 40 years ago, yeah, different world for you. Got it. Absolutely. But there was something about being an American and pride in our country and a belief that we actually have a culture and certain values that we all shared. And this notion that if America isn't the prominent, the most, most dominant military, political, and economic power in the world, some totalitarian system is going to become it, right? And if it's not us, you, you get to pick. You can make it the Chinese. You can have the Koreans. You can have the Ay Ayatollahs. You can have whoever you want. I am afraid, like you say, or, or uh, Scott, that we are in deep in steep decline. However, I do like to think I have enough humility to listen to Rudyard, who tells me from time to time it makes me feel better that there are some systemic problems with the Chinese as well. Oh, yeah. And so yeah. so well, we can so talk maybe, about maybe, that if you want. Yeah, maybe not the dem dem demise of maybe not that intimate and uh, imminent, but, but I see us going the wrong path. And, of course, the Chinese have always been on the wrong path. They're just doing very well. They're, they're winning, depending on how you define winning. The, 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 the Japanese were winning until they hit a collapse point. Uh, you know, it, 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 when you're on the upswing, it looks great. As soon as you find out that there was a limit, then you go, oh, I guess we weren't correct about everything after all. But so, uh, I, I, let me just introduce one last thought. I'm gonna, not going to try to go into the whole diatribe. But what I study is uh, primates, primate behavior, uh, because it tells me, it informs me about human behavior without language. Uh, and human behavior without language is the dominant form of human behavior. And so we can look at what uh, societies, our ancestors, and I'm talking about deep ancestors, uh, 100,000 year ago ancestors. Um, if we look at the culture they evolved that allowed them to survive and thrive and triumph over the Ice Age and et cetera, et cetera, um, it had families, it had uh, heterosexual pair bonding, uh, and it had... Um, Division of labor, Divisible and learning. there was child rearing there. You absolutely because that's how you preserve a culture, is you raise your children in your culture. So we live in a culture that is systematically trying to break apart parents from the role of uh, child rearing, and that wants to 
uh, destroy the culture that brought us into existence here and replace it with a completely untested culture that scientifically makes zero sense. We're performing experiments that have no basis in science and calling them science-based. And these, these experiments that we're making, if they fail, we can't admit it. We have well, the to all The say results the are kind of in, Scott, right? We've seen some of the some. results of this experiment, right? Yeah. I have a number of friends who consider themselves to be moderates or conservatives, and they have raised children that absolutely hate them, one of which calls the mother the B word or worse all the time, the C word even, because she does not believe like he does and his friends do, and he is super uber to the left, right? And she's kind of a middle, you know, she, she's, she's, She's kind of a regular Joe, you know, person, sweet as hell, gives to charity, never heard a fly. It doesn't have a racist bo bone in her body, right? But I keep telling her, you didn't raise him. You did not raise him. The school raised him. Social media raised him. All of our other uh, uh, systems raised him. You spent like eight minutes with him feeding him at night, right? Paying his bills and stuff, right? But the influence... Like you said, we've systematically tried to separate our children from parents and from a family, et cetera, so that the state can raise them and therefore, and then therefore reject their parents. And it's really sad. Well, it is. Groups, will nat I think we, we were actually, Rujit was already talking about the fact that groups will naturally shift the society in order to benefit them. Is it any wonder that a government that is shaping an education system shapes it in such a way as to destroy anything that would potentially counter the, the power them, of the yeah. government? Um, yeah, it, the, it Russians, the Russians paid teachers more than they paid doctors before the fall of the wall because fixing somebody's brain was more important than fixing somebody's leg. To, to change the topic, Orson, I'd like to compliment you on the Alvin Maker books because I've been doing alternate history for seven years. And for those that don't know, the um, Alvin Maker books are set in an alternate history version of America around in the 1820s in which magic is really practiced. And there are two aspects of your research I liked a lot. The first is one of my specialities is colonial America. And that bookshelf over there is all early American history. And you did a very good job. For example, um, in your borderland between Maryland and Pennsylvania, you moved the border of Maryland south because you have it being a Swedish colony, which would have resulted in Pennsylvania taking it in, taking that borderland in the late 17th century. So I thought you did a very good job with the alternate history. And I've done alternate history for seven years. And also your research of magic systems was very good, where you accurately broke down the philosophy of magic for the natives, African and European traditions, which is something that's very rare because there is, I kind of, I've studied mythology and the occult as a side thing for a little bit. And it's very difficult to understand a philosophy of magic because it involves encapsulating an entirely different view of the world. And uh, it's interesting to break down the philosophy that goes behind magic because it involves totally changing your framework of how reality works. And one of the things I find really interesting in a magic worldview is it has a lot less of a causal attitude towards the world, where most traditional cultures view the world holistically. This affects this, this affects this. We're all in a tangled web of existence. But in the modern world, we have tunnel vision because we only see through direct causation, which causes horrifying social events to the stuff we do. It, it has a lot of, uh, it's about blame. Yeah. Something's not good. Whose fault is it? Did Robert E. Lee fight for the slave cause? Then let's tear down his statues and punish him posthumously. Uh, we'll cancel dead people because they can't fight back. And we'll take away the icons of another culture because that's a bad culture, the way the American South is viewed. It's a bad culture. And therefore, any of their heroes who own slaves, which is most of them, uh, don't deserve to be honored within their culture. And uh, this cultural imperialism uh, is just outrageous from people who frown on cultural imperialism. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so we have, we have this really crazy, crazy idea that um, to be an open-minded person, a liberal open-minded person, 
you have to punish anyone who isn't open-minded in exactly the same way as you without them seeing any contradiction between those views. Now, I remember reading as a kid, somebody was talking about uh, tolerance being preached as a virtue. And he said, yes, but, but can you tolerate? Uh, wh wh what happens when the tolerant, tolerant people become intolerant? Who checks that? And uh, I thought that that's a weird argument. I didn't even understand it. Now I do, because we have raised in, raised tolerance of a certain list of people to a very high level. It's the absolute in our society. A tolerance of intellectual difference is non-existent. Non-existent. Because it's heresy. Um, yeah. But uh, this touches also on the notion of... Um, uh, presentism, that we yeah. judge the past by today's standards. And I say, great, you want to judge Robert E. Lee or Washington or any of those guys by today's standards, that's fine, but there's one caveat. You have to admit it got better. You can't say that today sucks if you're saying that, oh, these people were evil and bad and they lived by a different code and it was awful, et cetera. You, you, you can't have both. I'm very willing for you to say, oh, those people, are, we're going to tear down their, st their, their statues, et cetera. But then I'd like you to smile for a second and go, gosh, you know, it's gotten a little better. Well, and unfortunately – oh, I'm sorry, David. Are you going to well, finish? That's it. I'm, I'm good. I, I was just going to say I think that there's another realm you see this in because people will naturally find examples that make themselves feel superior. Unfortunately, I think this is a, a root element of pride. And by the way, that's the, the opposite of humility there, which is why if you're doing that a lot, that probably means you're not particularly humble. And one example in military history of this is being able to point to the French with the Maginot line or famous commanders throughout history and like, oh, well, look at this horrible failing. And, and they, if they had just done this, they would have been different. And uh, I was watching a really interesting YouTube video today, actually, on uh, a, super a Japanese supercarrier at the end of World War II that the, the admiral – it walks through step by step what the Japanese ca captain was doing, trying to get his carrier away from this American submarine that was pursuing it. Every step – as they explained it, every step was a very logical progression from A to B to C, what he was trying to do based on the information he had at the time. Knowing what we know at this moment and looking back at it, it was perhaps the worst amount of decisions he could have possibly made. But that doesn't matter because we d he didn't have our knowledge and he didn't have our mindset. He doesn't have the, the hindsight is 2020. He didn't have all of that. And we have to have the humility to be able to look at that in the moment and say in that moment, what was he, what was he doing? Put ourselves in that perspective, being able to um, being able to empathize, as Scott was talking about. And realize that we're not much better than than the people that we blame. Often, sometimes we're even worse. I would. World argue. War One is a lot like that, where it looks like an abstract that World War One is insane, but actually every single step that led up to World War One made total sense for the players involved. And I often think that lots of the things that we do because they're moralistic are actually self-interest. And I really like for Speaker of the Dead, for example, where there's the, no spoiler, there's an alien species that's been cordoned off and looks to protect them. Well, the reality is just because they don't want this alien species to reach human technology and populate the stars. And there's this kind of imperialism of tolerance that you see with how the humans deal with these alien species, where the aliens will say things that are literally true for them, but we won't respect what they're saying. And I often wonder in our current era, for example, with massive multicultural tolerance, are we multiculturally tolerant because we're better people or because it'll make more money if we can say there aren't any problems in Southeast Asia so we can send all our factories there or we can import lots of cheap immigrant, immigrant labor. Back in the 19th century, it was people's self-interest to be racially intolerant because you could conquer non-white ter territories and exploit them but now it's inside people's financial interest to be racially tolerant. And I would also point out, oh, hey, David, you're not on your mic. Or it's so, not so I think a lot of people would agree that people make decisions based on emotion, et cetera, and they, they justify them, rationalize them with logic, right? They try to come up with rationalizations. And I like to say that a day without a good rationalization is like a day without sunshine. People can't get, <laughs> can't get through the day 
you know, with ra rationalizing something. And that's how we got World War II and all these other things you talk about. Um, so perhaps we should be intolerant of people who think they're tolerant but aren't. I don't know what that combination of things is going to be. But, but what would you do to them? How would yeah, you? We, we would you tolerate know, them really hard. Persuasion is the only thing that lasts. We would kill you them with kindness. actually persuade them yeah. that to, to behave in a different way, and they find that it's more productive and makes them happier, then it is likely to last. But if we try to compel, uh, like the, the woke try to compel, uh, I don't think that the woke have ever persuaded anybody that they have attacked. They don't want to persuade them. Yeah, so, well, the day that you, the, the day that there's an argument on LinkedIn or Facebook or whatever, and the person goes, you know, that's brilliant. I never thought of it that way. You completely changed my worldview. I will probably have a heart attack, and the internet will break. Right? That that yeah, is never going to. It'll it'll break. We'll find out that all of the uh, the sites it, have fallen. I've yeah. um I've done two debates. I've done two debates in my life. The first with a communist. The second with a Russian propagandist. And the Russian propagandist was at a hundred times better than the communist because he was well read, well spoken. He believed in the truth. Debating the communist was one of the worst. It was horrible because he had no understanding of the truth. He kept on. He didn't actually have arguments. He went for odd homonyms and shaming. And I, I wonder. I honestly don't think convincing the woke is possible because it's it, the ideology is latched onto their brain like a virus. And well, but you can't convince say, a zealot, right? I would, no, just, right? I would just say that what you need to have is some degree that you cannot let a person who's clearly ideologically biased into a position of judgment. Universities, in the same way that university, most universities today would not hire a creationist professor, they cannot hire, why is it okay for them to hire a clearly communist professor, where the purpose of a university is to look for the truth, the purpose of a publishing house is to write books. The purpose of a comedy, whatever, is to tell jokes. And you can have people who have ideological opinions, but when the ideological opinions exist to overwrought everything else, then you're then you're destroying. You're you're committing you're committing the situation. civilizational suicide. Yeah, yeah exactly. In, in a lot of ways, so this is this is. I am stating this in the extreme to be very clear. It's not meant to be in the same way, but in a lot of ways we are dealing with in some form, in, in some ways, a form of malignant cancer. You yes. try to cordon it off. You don't allow it to get to your larynx and start going all over your body. And unfortunately, I think that's it, – C.S. Lewis has a great example of – or C.S. Lewis and then also J.R.R. Tolkien with um, Gollum. And the orcs, the orcs were in, in that mythology, they were originally elves and they were perverted into what they had become. And uh, C.S. Lewis talks about being bent as a, as a state of being. And unfortunately, I, th I think there are some in the, in the woke, and I will call it a cult. There are some in the woke cult that I think can be pulled out successfully. Um, Prager University recently had an interview with someone that said they accidentally red-pilled themselves in the, in the best sense of the word. And said, oh, wait, no, I, I realized that they were right, these other people that were talking. So there is some hope for some, but there is there is not for no, – no, unfortunately, no. I don't believe for everyone. Not all of them are going to be convinced. Yeah, well, and psychologically – are convinced with zealots. Yeah, let, let me give you an example of zealotry. So in India a long time ago, the Brahmin elites tried to convince the poor women to have fewer children and to put more energy into each one, et cetera, right? And it didn't really work. So they said, gosh, if we were to get the elders in the in the various villages to speak to them, et cetera, and, they, and we convinced them, then maybe they could convince them. So they brought a number of el elders in. They called dhotis, which is the name for the outfit they wear, right? And they call them these dhotis. They come in, and they convince them. And they go back to their village, and they tell them, hey, you know, let's not have so many kids. Let's uh, try to put more resources in them and have more of them survive, all that kind of stuff. And they were stoned to death. They were straight up stoned to death. What, what, they were, what they were saying to this group of women was so alien and so threatening to who they were as a person that they were not about to listen. They literally killed them. And you have to determine who you're talking about. And I'm going to draw a distinction between hyper-woke and woke because the original term woke, which has been bastardized quite a bit, was about the idea of being against, you know, police oppression, especially against those people of minorities, which nobody argues with, right? Everybody says bad thing, don't do it. We agree, and and it, it started off as a subtle movement, but it, just like, um, you know, um, uh, Jonathan Swift's modest proposal, 
you end up going down this path where you end up with baby farms for feeding people, right? You know, we're trying to end world hunger and you end up with this craziness. We start out with, you know, woke start off with a couple of decent principles and has become, you know, has been metastasized into something completely different. So I don't use, I don't beat up the woke. I don't like to harp on the hyper woke and draw a distinction between the two of those because there's some elements of this, but what happened to black lives matter and what happened, you know, with, with them becoming a completely overt communist group, it's on their website. Here's where our money goes, not giving any money to the children or whatever families of victims of police brutality. You know, that that's not what they said they were. It's disgusting. Is what it's it disgusting. Is. It's it's an abomination. Uh, yeah. It's a twisting. But the idea of consistency as a positive virtue does not exist now in America. Well, if If I said yesterday something and say something completely different today, but I still belong to the tribe. No. then I'm not challenged. But hypocrisy well, is not an here. evil. Being called a hypocrite is no big th deal to anybody anymore. No, and by the way, we know that Rule 13, Alins Alinsky's 13th rule, is basically ridicule people and shame them. Okay? And Rule 14, Rule 4 is hold your enemy to their standard because no one can live up to their own standards. If I don't have to live up to any standards, but you have to live up to your own, you can't, and I can then ridicule you for it and shame you for it. So this this playbook was written out a long time ago, and I used to follow it, and I see it playing out all the time. And this is why I say to moderates and conservatives, get off your ass, read a freaking book, read Alinsky. You're fighting out of your weight class. They're playing hockey, and you're playing Marcus of Queensberry rules, you know. And that and here's the problem: moderates are moderate. They want to go to work, raise their families, take care of their homes, etc. Right cling to their guns and their Bibles or whatever evil thing you want to say about them, right? You know, they just want to live their own lives, and they're not about to get up and protest. There are no such thing as radical moderates. I, I knew some. I knew I some. Just be with your... Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead with your usage of the term woke, because I was there when it was first used, and the first context I saw it in was when I was around 2016, and I was in high school, and my high school started out Christian, and it became progressively more and more progressive until... The year after I left, they replaced study of foreign culture week with social justice week. And people were using the term woke. And there were all we saw in our, sat in our school's auditorium and we talked about the emotional experience, or I didn't, other people around. People talk about their emotional experience in which they became woke. And that's what being woke is. It's being a born again. It's like being a born again Christian. It's like the, the quickening in the cat yeah. in, yeah. in yes. baptisms. It, it's like it's being born again as a religious as a religious function, experience, which is yeah. what it is. And I, I worry that if we use the term hyper woke, what we're doing is we're conceding lingual ground because their number one, their number one strength is the ability to control language. And so if by courting off smaller and smaller parts of the population that are insane, it kind of shows that they are, because the reality is they're a giant, they're, 15, 10% of the population who control all of society's major institutions who view social justice as almost a born again religion. Okay. Now I want to say that I do agree with you hundred percent. And you and I have talked about this linguistic control that if I take a person who is sort of a moderate and I call them a right wing nut, I've gotten to move that Overton window. Right. And yeah. I can call, I, if I call you, if you have to agree with what I call you so I can hear, I hear what you're saying about woke versus hyper woke. I get that. Um, I argue with a lot of my friends who call themselves conservative that they're not conservative. They think they are, and they have an affinity. They, they want to call themselves conservative because it feels good to them. They have the same emotional attachment to that that the left has to calling themselves left. So if we, if, but if they looked at each other's policies, and they, if, if you put two people in a room together and you go policy by policy by policy, unless they're absolute idiots, they probably agree on 80% of it. The vast majority of people are centrist. They are moderates, et cetera, right? They just like to call themselves different things for cultural reasons or whatever. And that language, the ability to control language is really important. I was The insurance industry is a great example. We don't call it a death uh, contract, right? It's, it's life insurance. It's not death insurance, right? Because that sounds better. But we also don't call it um, a contract. We call it a policy. <laughs> Policy sounds better than a contract. Right. So, <laughs> there you go. so Rod Rodrigo is making an, uh, an uh, actuarial statement here. Yeah. So. <laughs> and the last thing is we, we, don't use, we don't use the term um, payment. We call it a premium, which sounds like you want a prize. 
So everybody who's smart knows that if I use the right language, can couch it in the right terms, et cetera, right, that I can, can, I, I can win this verbal karate battle. And I'm telling you, the hyper-woke, the, the left, the progressives, are so much better at it. And um, I just think, you know, moderates, the, 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 the great unwashed middle here, needs to, to read a book on Sun Tzu or something and figure out how to, how to deal with this. I'm so well, glad I, you but, mentioned up Sun Tzu. Uh, that's my favorite, my favorite, one of my favorite books to read. I've read it four times in five, in three different versions. And the, it, it, he, he gets to the essence of warfare because all warfare is in the mind first, the minds of the commanders. And the, the most important truth that is in that whole book is know your enemy, know yourself. There is nothing else outside of those two truths. And the problem is that we are often very poor at doing both. We, want, we, we believe about the enemy what we want to believe, and we believe about ourselves what makes us feel good. And we know neither the enemy nor ourselves, which is a very dangerous place to be. Because we lack humility, that. back to your earlier point. Um, so on a positive note, we're going to wrap this up here a little bit, right, Rudyard? Ah. Wow. So uh, this has been fantastic. And I guess the thing that we probably want to wrap up with, if, if, if we want to wrap up now, is something around, something positive. i got to have my cookie, and i got to have my dessert at the end of the meal, right? I, I had my vegetables, right? Um, <laughs> i, I got to have a, a sweet thing or you don't feel finished. So, um, you know, um, you know, you've seen a lot, Scott. You've been around a little bit. You've studied a lot. You've read a lot. Um, when you look at where we're at now and the, the prospects for America, uh, being a bit, being a futurist, right? Uh, Rudyard likes to say that America is going to say the top dog, you know, at the top of the heap for the next hundred years. That, that's his belief. I'd, uh, I'd say 300. 300, uh, okay. And, and if we want to, we can. But we're already at a choosing point. If the Chinese once get a self-sustaining base on the moon, uh, we will have to ask their permission to do anything in space from then on. And that's an untenable position for any any nation on Earth, is to have to ask permission from them. It's They would be in a position in space the way the British were at sea between the Napoleonic Wars well, so. and uh, World War One, well, where and they are the buggers, right? In this scenario, they're the buggers. Is that correct? Nah, nah, I don't even want to. I mean, they're say a hive that. mind. They're Come human. They're the human Chinese beings. They're human beings. We can't stereotype any group as being uniform. I remember when I was in Jerusalem, I went into the old town, was in a uh, an Arab's shop, uh, looking to buy something. And he was chattering, chattering, making nice to the American and saying, well, I, we just, I just wonder when Bush is going to come over and straighten things out here. Mm. And I said, you're dreaming. It's mm. never going to happen. Americans will never put one soldier into any conflict here. So he reaches out, takes me by the back of my head, pulls me close. And in my ear, because he's terrified to say this, in my ear, he whispered, oh, I wish he would. Mm. Because he hates the way things are oh, yeah. now, and yet he can't say it. And we in America right now, if, if we say we have got to beat the Japanese to the moon, we've got to have a base there at least at the same time as them so they had, don't have a monopoly on it. We have to get ourselves outfitted in space so that we can instantly repair interchangeable parts on all of our satellites so that our communication system is redundant many times over. And things like that, are they're obvious from a military viewpoint. If you regard China as the adversary, which you have to if you're sane, but mm -hmm. we don't have many sane people on this sort of topic. And I would be called a warmonger. And, you know, well, it would well, you're be... You're sort of being Paul Revere here saying, hey, you know, the, the sky no, just no, 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 away. But it's, it's not... at least they already, they already knew what they would do if the Redcoats were coming. And we have no idea what we'll do. Yeah, we're, we're we don't, denying the we don't have a coming. government that is prepared to respond to an invasion of Taiwan. Mm -hmm. It's obvious that they have no plan to sustain Taiwan. And Warren if they try to do it. Stock. Warren Buffett's selling his stock in Taiwanese chip manufacturers. So. Yes, yes. So we have, we have a yes, very well. corrupt government, which replaced an, a not quite as corrupt uh, administration before that which replaced a not quite as corrupt, et cetera, et cetera. But we are in a position without leadership where the bureaucrats serve their own ideology uh, that does not change with elections. Elections 
you know, we laugh, laughably call ourselves a democracy, but our elections change almost nothing because they don't replace the bureaucracy. The Civil Service Act was one of the worst mistakes we've ever made uh, in terms of, of allowing our elections to have force. And there's all kinds of things that uh, impinge on any decision we're going to make. So as I right now, as America stands right now, I don't see any real political possibility of taking the steps necessary to counter China in space or on Earth. And yeah. so the more aggressive they feel, the only thing in our favor right now is how deeply conservative the Chinese are and always have been about committing themselves to any forward action. They're very, very reluctant to do that. That's the only reason Taiwan is still independent because we are so unprepared. Plus, we have just spent all of our reserves in Ukraine. And I think that helping Ukraine was a good move, but I think that it would have been good if we had also ramped up our production to keep, keep abreast of it, but we didn't. We are now stripped. And so- And we spend our money in other places that we can't yeah. quite account for. And, and so we, we are in a position that I think is desperate without knowing that we're desperate. We're starving and we think we're full or maybe too fat and need to go on a diet. We don't need to go on a military diet. We are not the world's only superpower. We are the world's former superpower. Mm -hmm. Our shadow is still everywhere, but our light is nowhere. And, and to your point on space, we need to be the superpower in space uh, or we'll repeat the same thing. Now, there are some things that, you know, you said if we choose – we can have a continued, you know, glorious path forward, right? We can have a, a, strong, a, a bright future. Um, for me, some of those things, the systemic things that need to be done are to deal with the bureaucracy. And to do that, I would be a big fan of term limits. Term limits would, uh, and, and also term limits in civil servants. I mean, maybe you can't, you can't live, you can't work for this, the government for more than 20 years or something That's like that, right? That would make a difference. Right. But, but you got to, I mean, who goes to work for the Environmental Protection Agency? people who are true believers in protecting the environment according to the dictates of that subcult of the religion. And so when you change the head of the institution by because of an election, nothing happens. Because nothing. yes, minister of the old British show is completely accurate. Yes, remember, exactly. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I've, I've put like and five so, hours into explaining this, so I'll have to keep this short, but I bet $1,000 China's going to have a revolution over the next five years. Their internal politics are completely messed up. They're currently fighting off between several different factions. She is trying to pull them back to Maoism to play off a couple different groups that want him to fall apart. They've had, they can't feed their population. They've had the biggest riot since Tiananmen Square. Their military, from what we've seen, is completely ineffective. And I think if they attack Taiwan, they, they, die, they, 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 they just die. Well, so, attacking Taiwan would run into the same kind of resistance as attacking Ukraine, but Taiwan doesn't have as much of a hinterland to retreat into. But yes, I think you may very well be right. But to count on the collapse of our enemies uh, is is not a strategy. Yeah, it, yeah I, one of my... We, oh, sorry. Go ahead, We've Josh. had the most... Uh, we've had... I'm... Uh, I'm, I'm more optimistic on America than a lot of other people, because even if our politics are completely sclerotic, our internal, internal culture still has a lot of dynamism. The reindustrialization over the last five years has one of the fastest ever. We've had a series of extremely rapid technological advances. We've established a very strong ally network, including India, Vietnam, Japan, and that is basically boxed in the Russo-Chinese alliance, and the Russo-Chinese alliance itself is fraying, where the Chinese, for example, never supported Russia and Ukraine, and there's a significant branch of Chinese nationalists that want to conquer Siberia. So even the crux of their alliance, and my researcher did a project on food around the world, and I would guess Russia, or the Middle East, Africa, China, will all experience rapid skyrocketing prices of food and we've already started to see that that will cause mass instability that america will not have because we have way too much food so those are all hopeful signs take yeah taking a look at it i i'm i'm always hesitant to assume that my enemy will make a mistake or that they will collapse because i i firmly believe that any 
any person, who, any general who believes his his opponent is an idiot makes it at least a pair. Because there's, <laughs> Great there's, saying. Yeah, that's, well, thank you. Um, and then the other thing, so what can we do positively? I, I think I, I wanted to talk real quick about, um, Scott was talking about primates. I wanted to talk about wolves real quick. A lot of, a lot, I hear some guys on the internet talk about, oh, I want to be an alpha or, a, or an omega or whatever we're uh, an, uh Whatever or an incel. About. No, yeah, kidding. whatever we're whatever we're talking the about. The odd thing is that 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 analogy of of alpha etc. has been found to not apply to wolves at all. Absolutely. Well, uh, it applies to baboons, but you know, yeah. even well, so that's the way we think. Wolves as pets, so yeah. At least, at least the article that I that uh, I was able to find very quickly is that it does apply to wolves, but it applies to wolves in the sense of a family unit. Yes, the alpha okay, yeah. is the father in the set, and the alpha female is the mother. In right. which case, what can you do on a on a very, very personal, basic level to affect the culture? You can be an alpha by finding, a, a, if you're a man, finding a nice woman and getting married and having kids. And if you're a woman, finding a, a nice guy and doing the same. I, I would I would usually – I would have referred to myself uh, six years ago as a conservative. Um, I actually don't anymore. I, I choose uh, – talking about linguistics. Linguistics are very important. I would refer to myself as a reclaimer because, as Richard pointed out, we've got 20 percent of the culture that has gone way off into magical thinking land, and the culture needs to be reclaimed. We need to take back the institutions that have been cultified by this group, and it can't, we, can't, we can't conserve anything because there's nothing left to conserve. All of the institutions are already controlled. The language is being corrupted. We have to reclaim it, reform it. To uh, bounce off your point, we should probably wrap this soon, is one of the things that worries me, and Dave Hamilton said before we don't have a far right, and I think that was true until the last two years, because uh, as a person who knows most other right conser- more right-wing YouTubers, and I read my comment section every day, is that the radicalization of comment sections among basically online young men who would be the fodder for a revolution – has moved to a really scary level. I made a tweet a couple of weeks ago, the right will soon be fine with witch burnings. And half of the people said, hell yeah, witch burnings are great. Or I see all these comments of people saying, how can you say the Nazis were bad? The Nazis were people, they're the last protectors of Western civilization. And uh, one of my friends is a school teacher and he said the 15 year olds in his class all love Andrew Tate. And I've seen that among young men as well, where I mean, I have mixed opinions about Andrew Tate, but if an entire generation says they love Andrew Tate and want to emulate him in every way, that's not a healthy sign for the direction society will go in. I don't think we had a far right, but also the direction things are going in because you have an entire, as I talked about in one of my latest videos, an entire generation of young men with absolutely no stake in the society and who have been vilified since childhood by insane feminists they're basically taking it they're taking this movement in a toxic way and i like what you're saying josh where you should be an alpha male in a way that's responsible it's a sheepdog versus a wolf yes well the world is wolves and we need our sheepdogs to protect ourselves to 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 support our families to support our culture etc that doesn't mean you have to be the abuser or whatever that sort of thing. Uh, and if you want to emasculate men and have no sheepdogs, good luck when a wolf shows up. Well, yeah. and Roger, I, I love your point. I just wanted to say that there was – I was actually thinking about that recently, about the fact that you have such a right-leaning I – would, I, would, I would say that the, le- that the, the, the ultra-woke, the left, however you want to say it, it has become so extreme in their complete dominance, I would argue, especially the last couple of years – that you are having an incredible backlash. The danger with that is if you have a backlash with no moral code, basically we've been going 180 degrees south, whatever. Um, If you are on the ocean and you know that you don't want to go 180 degrees, which is basically the point I believe we have reached in this society, and all you want to do is go anti-180 degrees, that doesn't tell you where to go. You have 359 points on the compass which, which to pick. What is absolutely necessary is having a moral code, a grounding pursuit of truth, that without that, once you know which way to go, 
then you have one direction and it's 275 or 275 degrees, whatever the particular thing is. Yeah. I completely but, agree. But with but otherwise you risk just going opposite that and that actually isn't pursuing anything. If anything, that can be more destructive, as you pointed out. In so, your video. Josh, can we agree that this right wing perhaps re it's a response? The alt right, uber right, whatever is a response to the feeling of being attacked. Both Hitler and Mussolini were the product of their experiences, right? One was an artist, one painter, poet, etc. Right? They had horrific experiences in World War One. Hitler shaved his face and ended with this little mustache because that's what would fit underneath a uh, a gas mask, you know, mustard gas, etc. And they came out bitter, twisted, you know, crazy, you know, so crazy. But in some ways, it's a it's a it's a logical response to a completely illogical, insane situation. I mean, that's what PTSD is, right? PTSD is a reasonable response to an unreasonable uh, 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 experience. So they were the product of their time and their environment. Um, if it hadn't been them, somebody else might have risen up. They just happened to be incredibly charismatic and therefore made them even more effective and dangerous. But I, I would argue that Trump only exists because many people, moderates and, and people on the right, considered him a, a, a bodyguard, that they felt like they were getting beat up. And they said, gosh, this guy will fight for me or whatever. He may be bombastic and I don't necessarily like him and I might have a beer with him. But hell, you know, I'm getting my ass kicked. So, you know, Trump, maybe, Trump maybe this guy... This. Trump What's played that? into this. Trump played into this as well. Where he and it's a quote I have heard, by the way, echoed many, many times. They are not coming after me. They are coming after yep. you. I'm just standing in the way. Yeah, saw, whether he, whether saw or not that's true. And on a side note, I think that is at least partially true if you're looking at a lot of the stuff that is going on. Mm -hmm. But whether but, or not that's true, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter in the sense that it is resonating with a lot of people. And I think it's possible. You, you, it's predictive. You can predict that if you vilify a group long enough, if you ostracize them, if you alienate them, if you discount them, et cetera, right? It's the reverse Pygmalion effect. Instead of getting good behavior out of them, you're going to get bad behavior out of them. Well, they think it's already started. The uh, the woke, that that portion of our country, seized upon January 6th as if it were as a huge revolution while they ignored the one all that happened. the rioting the summer before, yep. uh, which summer was mostly just... mostly peaceful, though. We, all of the rioting, the peaceful that's rioting peaceful that broke rioting store windows and, Anderson, and took Anderson. over the towns of several northwestern cities, etc. Uh, while the police stood by, um, the right can be uh, understood for having come to the belief that demonstrations will not be crushed and you won't be sent to jail, not knowing that there would be a completely different rule set. No, I and think so, they knew that they would go to jail. I think they knew they would go to jail. Well, and it was a, it was a double standard they did it anyway. Yeah. But, because but it the, was thing, you, the thing it was is, the thing, the thing about this is mm -hmm. that it was not an insurrection. It was not a coup attempt. But next time it, it might be. Because they had no idea of changing the government. They had no idea of actually installing new people in office. Uh, they just wanted to make it clear to Congress that they felt like they'd been robbed. And since the history of the Democratic Party, since Tammany Hall and earlier, has been one of stealing elections every single time. Uh, it's just ludicrous to think that that was the one that they didn't try to steal. Gaslighting uh, it has become an art form. Gaslighting yes. and saying no, in a, you know, I'm, I'm in bed with a woman, honey. You really believe your lying eyes? Yeah. No, yeah, no, no, no. Not, you know, do you trust me or do you trust your eyes? I mean, yeah. we, we, this happens over and it has become a virtuous act to gaslight and gaslight and gaslight. The idea that there was that this was the most pristine and that phrase drove me crazy. The most pristine election in history was the ultimate gaslighting. Admit it. There's no pristine elections. No, on either no. side, right? But so, the Obama administration wouldn't even prosecute obvious on film intimidation because it was his side intimidating, and that was okay. Uh, it's when the other side does it. So what we have this this huge gulf of hypocrisy uh, is the, it's the thing I have feared since the uh, mid '70s hmm. is that the leftward movement without the consensus of the people behind it. Because you can move to any direction if you have the consensus, but there has been zero attempt 
at building consensus, only intimidation and vilification. And it feels like the brown shirts to me now. Yeah, let's well, see that we're, we're used to that. We're used to that. You know, they're peeing on our leg, telling us it's raining. Uh, but nevertheless, um, what I feared from the beginning was the right wing uh, retaliation. The the uh, uh, so they're speaking, it seems that they're speaking it into existence, is my point. They are. They're calling it into existence. They're making it, they're acting as if it's true until, until it becomes it true. true. Yeah. Um, and as I said, I used to get in physical fistfights. I mean, I got to tell you, I uh, fought guys that were in the KKK. I got, a, I got my ass handed to me. Okay, I could I could find you a racist. I, I knew people that used the N word like it, like it was the word and. You know, all the time that they, they had no compunction, et cetera. And I would go fight, you know, nail and you know, tooth and nail with these guys. I, I can't find them today. It's not cool. It's not hip. If anybody, you know, if anybody said anything overtly racist in front of me, we, we'd have a problem. Right. And here's well, the no, thing. But they would back down immediately. And they would back they down. Wouldn't get challenged that they'd back down. So, so I don't I wasn't there and I don't know what happened at, at, at Brigham Young. But there was this story that a, 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 a black woman was called the N word why she served in basketball. every Sorry, in volleyball every time she served. I swear to God, had that happened and people called her that in a public forum today, if I was there, there would have been a problem. Yeah. I can't imagine a crowd letting that happen in today's world. No, I can't imagine. You know, if it's a Brigham Young University crowd, that person had better have been surrounded by like-thinking friends all the way around because that would not have been tolerated. And they would have uh, needed some form of phone blocking technology because phones would have come out. Yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. So there would have been 100 phones. I don't actually believe that those words were said. We have so many examples where people say that such things happened, but there is no objective evidence of it because, because it's not the in our left culture wants it's, to be persecuted. It's no they, longer in our culture. Yes. Well, yeah. it so, was in our culture. I experienced it, and it pisses me off. I go, look, Rosa Parks was a hero. Rosa Parks was a hero. I don't know what the hell you think you are. No. Yeah. Right? So I, I don't know. Have you guys uh, – I, I know we're supposed to be winding up, but this is such a good conversation. Have you guys ever heard of um, – oh, my gosh. I just completely blanked on his name. Very famous YouTuber, a little bit of a lefty. Um, Tim Pool. There we go. Oh, yeah. Completely skipped my mind for just a moment. Tim Pool. I listened to him quite a bit. He had a really interesting section on gang stalking. So this is an interesting element. And the fact that we have a more connected world, clearly that's going to be a good thing, right? Except he pointed out, and this was first established in the 1990s, early 2000s, that there was um, a bunch of people for the first time were able to connect outside of their social group. People had this mania that in the early 2000s that the government was spying on them, probably because they were, but, you know. Um, but there was this fascination that they were being gang stalked by bunches of agents. Well, prior to the Internet, they, that they would have had their immediate social group would have said, patted them on the soldier, shoulder and said, you're insane. You need to calm down. That's not true. Well, now that we're more connected, now you can get a support group for that gang stalking. And now everyone who believes it is now mutually reinforcing all these stories about gang stalking. And now they all know it's true, and they're the only ones who know. Well, That's you have the same problem online in major social media platforms that these particular stories – all you can I, if I can find a story about a white officer shooting a black person, if I can find a story about racist things, Juicy Smollett, if I can find that a story will, that about – That will the, bubble up, yeah. It'll bubble up and it'll pop up and it'll be right there. It'll be in your face. And you know what? The retraction or the other information, not going to be there. But you're reinforcing that gang stalking mentality. Now you have a support group of everyone who believes this is true. The world must be like this because this is what we think. And then so how do I form happen, one that where I'm taller and better looking and younger and rich? Uh, I don't I know if that's, that's a just, way to do that. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, yeah, everything that's except that's younger. Yeah. They actually had someone claim that that he was he he's sex sixty five. He says he identifies as forty one or something. Yeah, uh, like don't that. worry, it's coming. Yeah, I want yeah. to you know, I want to identify as a billionaire, and yeah, nobody's yeah. willing to support me in that. Yeah, the world. <laughs> needs, a, hey, and if they don't support you, they're haters. Exactly. Absolutely. They're, they're billionaire phobic. Yeah, yeah. Plutophobes. Plutophobes. I like that. We'll go with that. That's a very good point, Josh, and it's indicative of how the internet allows massive confirmation bias and thus looking away from the truth. And as we end, I want to throw out two final points. The first is 
even though the left talks at the far right, I don't think they have any understanding how effective the far right would actually be if orchestrated. They, they have no idea what would hit them. <laughs> and the second thing is I worry about America turning into a Latin American country and how we act because the right and the left have both said the elections were falsified and we've had rebellions. And this is not something you'd hear about in an English speaking country. This is how Brazil acts. This is how Mexico acts. And I don't want us to continue down that trajectory. And, and those are the two best examples of not acting that way in, in Latin America. Exactly. And before as we all turn off, um, thank you so much for coming, uh, Josh and Orson. And do you have anything you want to end on? I'm not sure we ever got to anything that was on my original agenda because what was going on here, freelance was just so wonderful. I really had a great conversation and I can't well, wait to be misquoted in the media. That, that, that gives me that the uh, entree to ask you to come back and talk about what you really wanted to talk about. <laughs> sure. Yeah. We'd be happy to have you as a guest another time. Um, you invite me. I'll be there. You're wonderful. very kind. Yeah. Thank you all. Y'all have a great evening. Great, uh, great visiting with you. And we look forward to, uh, seeing the uh, viewers again on our next episode. Okay. It was a pleasure. Take care.